How's it going everybody? So those of you who've watched me for a while know that at the end of every year I always put up my best movies of the year video on my channel. But this past year I didn't do that. And that's for a couple reasons. Mainly because 2020 was just kind of a weird year. There were a lot of movies that were pushed back into 2021 and really all we had for most of the year was streaming releases. And because of that, as of right now, I haven't seen all the films from 2020 that I feel like I should see before I make that video. Over the past couple weeks, I have been catching up on a lot of films that I felt like I missed out on throughout the year, but there's still a few films that I probably won't get to see until at least February. So I just, I haven't seen enough films to put out the video that I want to put out on my channel just yet. So in the meantime, until I get the chance to see some of those films, I thought I'd give you guys another video that kind of rounds out the year that we just had, but looking at another category, and that is video games. Video games kind of was like my thing this past year. It was one of the few constants that I had that got me through 2020. There were a lot of great video games, and I played a lot of them since I had a lot of time stuck at home. And even though movies will always be my main focus on this channel, I really did make a conscious effort over the past year to talk more about video games on this channel. And since 2020, was such a great year for games and there was a lot of amazing stuff to play. I thought this would be a good thing to talk about this week. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about the five best games that I played throughout the year. These are just my personal picks. These are the ones that I enjoyed the most out of 2020. I didn't play every game. Games are expensive, so it's not the kind of thing where I could just throw down 60, 70 dollars a week and play whatever's coming out. But I did play a lot of video games this year. However, there is one thing that I wanted to address before I start talking about these games. Right now, I'm about halfway through the Final Fantasy VII Remake, and I really love it so far. I think it's a great game. But since I haven't beaten the main story yet, I don't feel like it'd be fair for me to include it on this list because I'd just be talking about the section of the game that I played and not the game as a whole. So I'm just gonna leave that out, but I will say definitely play that game if you can. It's really great so far. Just wanted to get that out of the way. But I do have a couple of honorable mentions. These are games that I thought were really good, but didn't quite make it in my top five. Astro's Playroom. This is the game that's bundled in with every PS5 system. It's basically just like a demo for you to see what the controller can do. But I thought this game was really fun. It kind of surprised me. Outside of just being a fun introductory game for the PlayStation 5, it was just a really solid platformer, and I loved going through all the worlds and experiencing it all. The game is filled with PlayStation Easter eggs, so if you've been playing PlayStation games for a long time, there's some really cool stuff in here. And it was also really cool to see what the DualSense controller could do. And aside from all that, it's just a really fun, solid game. Definitely worth playing if you have a PlayStation 5 or if you're planning to get one in the future. And my last honorable mention is Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time. I never played the original Crash games when they came out. I wasn't even born yet. But I did play the Insane Trilogy when it came out. That was the remaster that they did for PS4 in 2017. And I loved all three of the games, so when they announced they were making a fourth one, kind of going back to the roots of the franchise, I was really excited to see what they would do with it, and they did not disappoint. But they also changed up some things in ways that I really appreciated. I like how the game was more narrative-based than the other ones. It felt like I was watching an old Saturday morning cartoon during all the cinematic scenes, and I thought the masks were a great idea. You could slow down time or do that really powerful spin attack or change the gravity. That made the game really fun. Not to mention the game is beautiful. I love the art style. It's so colorful and vibrant. They really did a great job with the colors and the environments and all that stuff. This game was just a really nice surprise. I feel like it was everything I needed towards the end of 2020. It was just a solid, creative, imaginative game. So those are my honorable mentions. Definitely worth checking out if you ever get the chance to. Both are really good games. But now let's get on to my top five of the year. Coming in at number five is the game on this list that I actually started and finished the most recently. So it's definitely the freshest in my head out of all of these, but I think it's also fresh in the heads of a lot of people because it's the center of a lot of controversy right now. Cyberpunk 2077. Obviously there's been a lot of issues with this game. They basically just put out the console version when it wasn't finished yet. And I hate it when studios do this, but we have to remember that this isn't the first time that this has happened with a game. But the fact that it happened the way it did with Cyberpunk when this is such a big game that so many people were looking forward to and they just kind of fucked up the entire launch. It was kind of crazy. I feel really bad for the people who got it on PS4 or Xbox One and just didn't get the product that they were promised, but gratefully I have been playing it on PS5 and my version of the game has not been too buggy, save for 
it crashing like every time I play it, but I have a high tolerance for a lot of this stuff. But I do think there's potentially some good that will come out of this. The fact that studios might look at what CD Projekt Red did and how bad of a launch this was and how they've kind of lost trust with a lot of their fans, even though they used to be like the king of game studios. And that model of putting out a game when it's not finished yet might happen a lot less frequently than it does right now. So I'm really hoping for that, but let's talk about this game for a second. I really enjoyed this game as a whole. I definitely don't think it's as great as people were hyping it up to be for the past several years. I was always kind of on the outside looking in with this one. I was never really that excited for it before it released. And it seemed like people were hyping up this game like it was going to be this game to end world hunger or something. <laughs> it's definitely not that, but it is a very cool game with one of the coolest game worlds that I've explored in a really long time. Night City is easily my favorite thing about this game. It's just such a cool place to walk around in and explore and I've really never seen anything like it in a video game. CD Projekt Red really went the extra mile to make it feel like a real lived-in futuristic city. Minus the fact that the NPCs are kind of dumb and they just walk around. I would have liked for them to be a little more detailed. That probably would have made the game a little more immersive. But one of my favorite things to do in the game is just drive around and look at everything and take it all in because the world they created here is really awesome. It's a very deep game with a lot of integrated systems and that kind of stuff. And as someone who doesn't really play a lot of RPGs in the first place, it was kind of overwhelming at first, but once you get further into it and you get to upgrade your character and get more powerful weapons, it can be really fun. I also ended up really liking the gunplay. The enemies are really bullet spongy and it takes a while to take them out, but that actually kind of made the game more challenging. The story I also really liked. I thought it had a considerable amount of heart and emotion to it. And I ended up getting pretty invested in V's quest and some of the people that he met along the way. Also, the side quests in this game. I love the fact that they're just as impactful, if not more so, than the main story. For example, I did all the side quests with the Pan Am character, which eventually led to my V having a romance with her. And it completely changed the outcome of the game and the kind of ending that I had. And that's just really cool to me. The fact that anyone can play this game and have a different ending and a different outcome I just really like that. And Keanu Reeves was great. I loved him as Johnny Silverhand. He's definitely an asshole, but man, Keanu just, he knows what he's doing and he does a great job at it. I really liked his relationship with V and how they kind of hated each other at first, but over the course of the game, they kind of grew on each other in a way. So even though Cyberpunk 2077 might not be the game that everybody hyped it up to be over the last several years, I had a great time with it. I absolutely love the world that was created here. I love the main quest line, but I actually got really invested in a lot of the side quests and spent a lot of time on those. I really like some of the characters and I'm definitely not done with it. I just finished the main story recently, but I'm definitely going to go back in and explore more of Night City. Moving on to number four, we have a game that none of us thought we were going to get, but it ended up being a nice little surprise at the end of the year. Spider-Man Miles Morales. I kind of just assumed that Insomniac would go straight to making the sequel to the 2018 Spider-Man game, but instead we got this awesome, smaller story that just focused on Miles' character to tie us over until then. And it was great! This game was such an awesome way to kick off the launch of the PlayStation 5. It's very familiar if you played the original Spider-Man game, and it's definitely not some massive overhaul when compared to the first one, but it didn't need to be. It was very fun, and it had a very emotionally satisfying story, and it kept everything that I loved about the original. Minus the new Peter Parker face, but I guess that's a conversation for another video. In this game, we got to see Miles take on the role of being New York's only Spider-Man for a period of time, and he was such an endearing character, and you really can root for him throughout the course of this game. I love the way that the game presented his personal life and his relationship with his family and friends. And I'm probably going to get into spoilers here, so if you haven't played this game, you might want to skip over. Specifically, one thing I wanted to talk about in my review that I kind of alluded to was the Prowler fight. That's one of the best scenes in the whole game. I thought it was really emotional, and I'm glad they put the Uncle Aaron character in the game. Also, Finn, I thought was a really compelling character, and I'm glad she kind of became the main villain presence in the game because the Simon Krieger person was really boring. <laughs> and the game is beautiful. I love the winter New York City setting. Similar to Cyberpunk 2077, this is the kind of game that you kind of just want to walk around in, or swing around in, I guess you'd say. Fun combat, amazing graphics, and I can't wait to see what happens next in the Insomniac Spider-Man universe. I think it'll be really interesting to see how they do this 
dynamic with Peter and Miles now that they can be like two different Spider-Men. Maybe in the next game they'll have you switch between the two to fight different enemies, which sounds really cool and I can't wait to see what they do with it. And it's definitely one of the best games of the year. Now moving on to number three, there is no better game that explains what it was like to live in the year 2020 than Animal Crossing New Horizons. Right when the pandemic hit and the world shut down, we all had to be quarantined inside our homes and couldn't go anywhere, and Nintendo saved us all with this amazing, wholesome game. And it took the world by a freaking storm. It felt like everyone I knew was playing this game at one point. People were just going out and buying Nintendo Switches to play this game, and so many people were visiting each other's islands and stuff. I just, seeing how excited people were about it, that was one of the highlights of 2020 for me and all the memes and stuff. It became like a cultural event almost, and that was great to see. People are still playing it all the time, and for good reason, because this game is so much fun and it's so relaxing. I'm usually not into life simulator games. I kind of steer clear of stuff like that, but I played so much of this game, and I still do play it occasionally from time to time. There's so many things you can do in this game that honestly make it kind of addicting for a while. Building up your island, trying to get a 5 star rating, getting to know your villagers, crafting new items and finding rare recipes, catching fish and putting all the creatures in your museum. That's actually one of my favorite things about the game is just going around and catching fish and bugs and sea creatures and stuff like that and displaying them in your museum. And since it's been some time since the game released, it's really cool now to see how the game changes with the seasons and with the new updates. Like just recently I went to see what they did for Christmas and they had this really great little activity where you could like pretend to be Santa and deliver presents to your villagers and that really keeps the game interesting and makes me want to play it for however long they keep adding new content to it. With how terrible 2020 was I really think this game gave us the fun wholesome escapism that all of us kind of needed. I love Animal Crossing New Horizons, could not have come out at a better time, and I'll probably be playing it for a while. Now at number two we have a game that is not fun to talk about on the internet. I said I was going to review this game, but I didn't end up doing that for multiple reasons, one of them being the discourse surrounding this game was just kind of awful and I felt like I didn't want to add to that. But I also kind of wanted to let it sit for a while and really process how I felt about this game before I talked about it on my channel. And now, after many months have passed since I've played it, I do think I can do that now. So, The Last of Us Part Two is my second favorite game of the year. Definitely a controversial one, probably one of the most polarizing games ever made. It seems like everyone's just screaming about what they loved or what they hated about this game, and so that's why it's kind of not fun to talk about. But I don't care. I love this game, and I want to talk about it, because for me, The Last of Us Part Two has some of the best storytelling that I've ever experienced across any medium. It's not perfect, and it definitely has some issues. I think some of the characters are really underwritten, and some of the story decisions that it made I didn't love, and it's such a sad game. That's not really a big issue that I have with it, but there are times where I wish it wasn't as depressing as it is. It just seems like every other scene there's something awful happening to the characters that just makes you feel bad. I saw one guy on Twitter describe it as a misery simulator. And yeah, I'd have to agree with that characterization. <laughs> However, I personally have never been as emotionally impacted by a video game as I have with The Last of Us Part Two. I found this to be an extremely moving story with so much to say about revenge and what it does to a person and losing someone and what loss and pain can do to human beings. And I genuinely could not stop thinking about it after I played it. I would watch scenes from the game on YouTube afterwards, and I texted a lot of my friends who I knew had played the game just to see how they felt about it or if they had the same kind of emotional reaction to it that I did. It just really resonated with me, and I love the first Last of Us. If you guys saw my review, you know that that might be my favorite game of all time. So this one had some big shoes to fill, and it's definitely not the story that I wanted to see. If you came to me with my ideas for what a Last of Us sequel could be, the thing that they went with would probably be like the last thing on the list, but I have to applaud Neil Druckmann and Naughty Dog for telling the story that they wanted to tell, and absolutely pulling no punches in that. I also really liked the non-linear structure of the story, and how sometimes they would go back in time or forward in time, and then you spend all this time with another character, and then they go back in time and forward in time with her. It kind of felt like I was watching a novel play out on screen, and I thought that was really cool. Just seeing Ellie descend into her own hatred, and just to the point where she was completely consumed by it and couldn't 
live for anything else. I thought it was really powerful. But also, the game shows you the other side of that hatred with Abby, played masterfully by Laura Bailey. I thought it was a great idea that the game switched perspectives in the way that it did, because it showed you this character that you absolutely hate with a burning passion for the whole first half of the game, and then you see it in this completely different way that recontextualizes everything that you've played up until now, and you kind of start to understand her, and you sympathize with her. And I've never really seen anything like that in a video game before. It's an extremely emotionally complex game with so many different layers to it, and I can completely understand why people hated this game, and why people hate it with the burning passion that they do, because some of the choices are not easy choices, and they really challenge the player. But I'm also the kind of person who really likes creative risks. I just love when someone tells the story that they want to tell without being bogged down by studios or fans or what people are going to think about it. That just really resonates with me when someone does that, and that's part of why I really love this game. Also, on a technical level, this game is a masterpiece. Some of the best graphics I've ever seen in video games. There's some scenes in this game that almost look photorealistic. The music, you had a great score by Gustavo Santoya. The sound design, just the way this game is directed, it feels like a movie. And that's what I love about video games, when they can feel like movies. And it's acted wonderfully all across the board. Ashley Johnson as Ellie. Man, this must have been a tough role for her to play, but she did it so beautifully to the point where I felt like I was watching a real person. Troy Baker as Joel didn't have a lot to do in the game, and he definitely wasn't the main focus, but the scenes that he was in I thought were extremely impactful, and specifically, this kind of is mild spoilers, so if you haven't played this game, don't watch this part, but specifically the scene where he tells Ellie the truth about what happened. Hands down, the best acting I've ever seen in a video game. This game just had a bigger impact on me than probably any game I've ever played, and it's an experience that I will never forget. All right, so we're now on my pick for the game of the year. This one actually was kind of a surprise for me. I was excited for this game and looking forward to it for a while, but I did not think I was gonna like it quite as much as I did. Ghost of Tsushima. There's several reasons I can point to for why this game is number one on my list. First of all, I got the Platinum Trophy on it, and that's extremely rare for me. The only other game I've ever done that for is Spider-Man. But I just got so invested in the world of this game to a point where I wanted to explore everything it had to offer. Visually, it's such a cool-looking game, and I think Sucker Punch succeeded in making what is the most authentic samurai experience that you can have with a video game. Just from the music to the stylized action and the way the combat works, it felt like I was playing through an old Kurosawa movie. The combat is extremely satisfying when you progress deeper into it. At first I was really bad at it, and I didn't know what I was doing half the time, but once I started getting all the different stances and knew which ones worked on which enemies, it got to be really fun, and it might be the best thing about the game, just taking out Mongol dudes left and right. The battles and the duels feel really tense, and it can actually be pretty challenging at times, because you kind of have to think on your feet when you're facing down a huge swarm of Mongols. I also really enjoyed the story. I loved Jin Sakai, thought he was a really cool character, and just to see him go against some of the people that were closest to him and the code of the samurai, that was really interesting, and it made for some really good dynamics, particularly between him and Lord Shimura. That's where a lot of the emotional weight of this game took place. I also really liked other characters like Yuna, and the side quests in this game are really great. They're definitely not just kind of bullshit whatever side quests. They actually kind of tell their own stories. Not to mention it's one of the most beautiful games that I've ever laid eyes on. Right from the very beginning when there's the title sequence where you're running through the field on your horse, you can just tell it's going to be such a gorgeous game. And the game has a full-fledged Kurosawa mode, which is absolutely beautiful. Not only does it put the game in black and white, but it also puts this film grain over everything, and it even changes the sound to make it feel like an old Akira Kurosawa movie. I absolutely loved Ghost of Tsushima. It felt like such a big, epic samurai adventure. I love the characters and the places that it took them in the story. There are parts of the game that get really dark and serious, and it knows how to do those scenes really well. But it was just so much fun to play the entire way through. And it was a nice palate cleanser right after coming off of Last of Us Part II, because that game was so dark, and this game was just like fun and not as heavy. So the timing that this game came out was really great. I also love the combat. I found it extremely satisfying. And it goes without saying that this is one of the most beautiful games ever made. Without a doubt, one of the best games of the past console generation and my favorite game of 2020. So those are some games that I played last year that I really wanted to talk about on my channel. It was obviously an extremely good year for video games. 
and I can't wait to do more videos on this subject throughout 2021. Thank you guys so much for watching this. I really do appreciate it. Is there any games that you feel like I left out or that I should check out if I haven't played them? Let me know down in the comments below. Also, one thing that I wanted to give you guys a heads up about. So, my friends Brendan Murphy and Matthew Brown run a movie podcast called A Few Good Movies. This footage that you're seeing right now is from an episode where they brought me on to discuss one of my favorite movies of all time, Whiplash. But starting this week, they're going to have me as a guest to talk about every episode of the upcoming Marvel Disney Plus show, WandaVision, which I'm really excited about. So I'll put a link to their channel in the description below. Be sure to give them a subscribe because they're putting out great stuff all the time. And they're also just really good friends of mine. So you can look forward to those videos very soon. Also, I am going to have my Best Movies of 2020 video up sometime in February. We'll see when I finally watch all the films that I want to watch before I make that video. So you can look forward to that as well. Also, be sure to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.